Alright, so, hey everybody. Look at my eyebrows. I just got them. Oof. Ooh. Okay, so, for my English project, I'm doing book the third of Tale of Two Cities. So nice. Oof, this spot. Oof, oof, oof. In secret. So, the summary is. So, it's the year 1972, and Charles Darnay, as you learned in book the second, is traveling from England to Paris during the time of the revolution and attempts to save wrongly prisoned Gabelle. As he travels through villages, he is referred to an immigrant and an aristocrat, and is forced to have an escort to his deemed location, which is the Wall of Paris. After decrees against the immigrants have been created and are continuing to be created. All right, oh, hands free. <laughs> Oh no! Okay, anyway, so, once he arrives at the Wall of Paris, it is discovered that he is immigrant Evermond, and is consigned to the prison of La Force with no explanation, including when he consigns Mr. Defarge De 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 to explain to him what is going on. With all communications of the outside world cut off, Darnay becomes delusional. Or Charles Darnay. Charles! thinking about Dr. Bennett and Lucy while, while locked up in a small cell alone in secret. So, next, plot relation. So, Charles Darnay's trip from England to Paris is much like Mr. Lorry's trip from England to France. Both men were undergoing a secret mission and attempts to free an innocent prisoner. Secondly, Charles Darnay being locked up is much like Dr. Bennett encountered with the Bastille, who was imprisoned for almost, almost 18 years. Both men were secret prisoners who had no idea when they were going to be released and all communications with the outside world were cut off. The first thing I noticed about this chapter was the title, In Secret. It made me want to make predictions on what this chapter was going to be about just by reading the title, which is good on Dickens. For example, was a new fortress going to be taken over by the revolutionaries or was a secret mission put in place? The second thing I noticed about the chapter was how the severity of the revolution has had an had increased. Each village had revolutionaries inside of it inspecting those who were coming and going. So, the mood. The mood. The schmood. The mood the chapter creates at the beginning of the novel is an anxious slash mysterious feeling. The book does this by explaining the change that has swept over all the villages. Citizen patriots are now being ordered to question and view the papers of all comers and goers, which leaves us with the anticipation of whether Charles Darnay will be affected by this. As the chapter moves along, the idea of anxiously awaiting to see what happens to Darnay does not change. The mood of mystery also does not change, because at the end of the chapter we are left with questions such as, why is Darnay imprisoned? Will he have any contact with the outside world? Is this a relapse of what happened to Dr. Manette? Oh. Okay. So, certain images that remind me of previous encountered Im <coughs> images are the French prison, La Force. Dr. Manette, as described in Book the First, was wrongly imprisoned inside the Bastille under very secret circumstances. The connection between the two prisoners is that, much like Dr. Manette, Charles Darnay's imprisonment is very mysterious and unclear. Charles Darnay even says that he believes he is going to prison unjustly and has been wrongly imprisoned, just like Dr. Manette. Oh my goodness! So, some literary devices include personification. Ooh. Personification is giving inanimate objects human qualities and motivations. So, the passage that I shall read to you right now that includes a personification includes... The sharp female newly born and called La Guillotine, Dickens 244. Mr. Darnay is in fact speaking of the guillotine, ding, 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 which all of us can tell is not a real newborn female. Please, we're not that dumb. Therefore, is an example of a literary device personification. A second literary, literary, a second literary, literary, device that can be found in this chapter is a simile. A comparison using like or as. The passage that includes a simile is, now I am left as if I were dead. 
Dickens 247. In this quotation, Darnay is comparing himself to a dead man, which helps the reader grab a more powerful description of what Darnay's imprisonment is really like. Darnay is left in his cell, all alone and enclosed, with no contact with any of the other prisoners, which is like a dead person being buried in a closed space, with no contact with people who knew them when they were alive. Okay, so, the symbols. Symbol. Symbolism. Symbol, symbol. Cinnamon, cinnamon, syllable. Okay, so, the first symbol is Lucy's golden hair slash thread. So, the golden hair occurred in book the first when Lucy was introduced because it represents her golden hair. My hair is not golden, just, you know, this is hair. It was introduced and represented her kind personality. And in book the second, the golden thread was the main idea and it was that Lucy binds all characters together in an unbreakable force. The significance of this symbol being mentioned is the possibility of foreshadowing that Lucy will help Darnay be released from prison. So, this, let me get my hand out of there. <laughs> okay, so, the first, second symbol, the first second, yeah, the first second. The second symbol in my chapter is shoes. So, the symbol of shoes first occurred in book the first when Dr. Manette was still being re-socialized after just being released from the Bastille. In book the second, whenever Dr. Manette relapses into his memories of being imprisoned. In A Tale of Two Cities, the shoes represent the inescapable past, and if you recall, Darnay had already been in trial as a criminal at the beginning of book the first and is now being called a prisoner again. Is that a repetition? I think so. So, one could infer that perhaps this will be a relapse of what occurred at the beginning of book the second and Darnay will be freed once again. First, let's make this clear. There are not really any new notable characters. So, the chapter revolves around two main characters that we've already been introduced to. Monsieur... Miss Mons Monsieur Defarge and Mr. Charles Darnay. So, Monsieur Defarge is a broad, strong man, which is important qualities for a leader, who has a nice personality. It is important to note that he is also a revolutionist who leads around men with a codename Jacques. We see Monsieur Defarge's revolutionary side during this chapter when both Defarge and Darnay are speaking to one another. Defarge refuses to give Darnay assistance and shows no mercy towards him. Proof to his cold-hearted nature is, I will do nothing for. My duty is to my country and the people. I am sworn servant of both, against you. I will do nothing for you. Dickens, 243. So... As the revolution has intensified, so has Mr. Defarge's hunger for justice against the aristocrats, and he has started to become more of a stern leader. I personally admire Defarge's hunger for justice and the idea of him going against the revolution and fighting for what he believes in, but I do not agree with the amount of violence him and his wife, Madame Defarge, have orchestrated. Another character that this chapter revolves around is Charles Darney. So as we know, he is a young man with dark hair, dark eyes, and a pale complexion. Typically, people with darker hair are seen as more attractive and appealing, which could be the reason for his well-mannered and kind personality, and how he gets out of being in prison so easily. Charles Darnay has always displayed himself as a generous, kind, and heroic character, so as he is traveling to France to save Gabelle and starting no fights when he is wrongly in imprisoned, Readers are not surprised by this, therefore, no, Charles Darnay has not developed or changed. I truly be feel bad for Charles Darnay. This is because us readers know that Darnay disagrees with the ways of the aristocracy and his uncle, but because Defarge and the other revolutionaries do not, Darnay is taken into unjustly imprisonment. Therefore, hashtag Charles Darnay deserved better. So, let's get into themes. The themes. The themes. Let's go themes. Although the theme of the contrast of the rich and poor is commonly found throughout Tale of Two Cities, this chapter is unique in a way that there is no contrast between the rich and poor, which is my first theme for this chapter. Here is a passage found in my chapter that shows that there is no contrast between the rich and poor. Charles Darnay felt it hopeless to entreat him further, and his pride was touched besides. 
As they walked on in silence, he could not but see how they used the people were to the spectacle of prisoners passing along the streets. The very children scarcely noticed him. A few passers turned their heads, and a few shook their fingers at him as an aristocrat. Otherwise, that a man in good clothes should be going to prison was no more remarkable than a laborer in work clothes should be going to work. Dickens, 244. As you can see, the townsfolk aren't surprised to see a clean, well-off man being imprisoned, and are in fact used to seeing men of his nature prisoners, whereas a bias is that only poor, dirty citizens are imprisoned. Theme number two, injustice, is also very prevalent in this chapter. When Charles Darnay arrives at the wall of Paris, he is arrested because he is an aristocrat, more specifically, an aristocrat Evermond, related to Marquis Evermond, a cruel and unkind aristocrat. Us readers know that Charles Darnay is nothing like his uncle, but to the revolutionary, including Monsieur Defarge, he is seen as nothing less than an Evermond aristocrat and is treated unjustly for it. A passage that shows how unjustly Charles Darnay was treated when he reaches the wall of Paris is as follows. Without doubt, you are consigned, Evermond, to the prison of La Force. Just heaven, explained Darnay. Under what law and for what offense? The officer looked up from a slip of paper for a moment. We have new no laws, Evermond, and new offenses since you are here. He said it with a hard smile and went on writing. I entreat you to observe that I have come here voluntarily in response to that written appeal of a fellow countryman which lies before you. I demand no more than the opportunity to do so without delay. Is that not my right? Emigrants have no rights, Evermond, was the solid reply. As you can see, Charles Zernay, although an immigrant, was not trying to do any harm and was just trying to help his dear friend Gabelle, a Frenchman. All right, so let's get down to business. The final question. Was the chapter in secret of Book the Third really worth mentioning? Yes, it was. Due to this being the first chapter of Book the Third, I do believe that it is very critical for the plot. At the beginning of the chapter, it, it is the year 1792, and paints a picture of how the revolution has evolved, which is important in order for the reader to understand based on what happens to Charles Darnay. In case you need a recap, he has been imprisoned with no explanation as to why, in a very secretive manner. This chapter also leads to decrees of selling the property of immigrants and the new future decrees of banning and killing immigrants. This directly relates to Charles Darnay, for he is referred to an immigrant while traveling. The chapter also identifies Charles Darnay as prisoner Evermond, an aristocrat, which could lead to Darnay's future imprisonment and death. Charles Darnay is also put into imprisonment and is later identified as a prisoner in secret. When he is identified as a prisoner in secret, the goaler gives his regrets to Darnay. This could help one infer that a foreshadowing is to come about and that events could affect Darnay because of his secrecy, including, like I mentioned before, death. Lastly, the last paragraph of this chapter is the time that Darnay thinks of Lucy and Dr. Manette. By Darnay reflecting on his memory of Dr. Manette, it makes the reader wonder if the unfortunate instances that happened to Dr. Manette will happen to Darnay. Alright, that's the end, folks. Peace!